Hi, Dr. Carney. Good afternoon. I'm Isha, a high school student who's interested in being a veterinarian. I'm excited to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Patrick Carney, Assistant Professor of Community Practice Service at the Cornell University College of Veterinary Medicine. He was born and raised in New Hampshire, went to undergrad at Washington University in St. Louis, and got his veterinary degree from Cornell. Despite having no intention of returning to Cornell, after 11 years, an internship, residency, and a PhD in epidemiology, he joined the faculty in the primary care group at Cornell. Teaching is his professional passion. His research largely focuses on helping other clinician scientists design and analyze clinical studies, but he also investigates the evidence base underpinning many of the common things general practitioners do on a daily basis, particularly around the use of diagnostics. He is a member of Vets Beyond Borders, the New York State Veterinary Medical Society, and the AVMA. He met his wife in his very first class in vet school, and they now have two amazing children, five chickens, a horse, and a cat. I'm thrilled to welcome Dr. Carney to the interview series on the careers of veterinarians. Thank you so much for chatting with me today. Thank you. So could you first tell us about your work and feel free to show any pictures or slides that you want? Sure. So um, you had mentioned the Vets Beyond Borders. This picture here is actually taken um, up in northern India, where I did a spay, neuter, and rabies control clinic with Vets Beyond Borders. Um, and this is just kind of the plug for veterinarians get to do amazing things, and really the world is, is open, whatever you want to do. Um, so who am I? You already did a lot with that in the introduction, but the reason I'm here, I'm a veterinarian. Um, but the cool thing about your series and about this profession is that there's so much that goes along with that. So you can say you're a veterinarian, and that doesn't really define what it is that you do. So um, a lot of my job is kind of what we think of. So I, I do cats and dogs. Uh, I don't do exotic species. I don't do wildlife. I don't do horses and cows. I leave those to my wife. Um, so things like annual exams, vaccines, preventative care. I do some urgent care. So things that aren't quite serious enough to go to an emergency room, but need to be seen sooner rather than later. Um, a lot of chronic disease diagnosis and management. So a lot of the diseases that dogs and cats get that are similar to human diseases, they get chronic kidney disease, they get chronic liver diseases, that sort of thing. Um, I do some surgery, we'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, and then some dentistry as well. So one of the beautiful things about being a veterinarian is that you get to do all of these things. If you're an MD, you're often pigeonholed into doing something very, very specific. So I am also an internist, and this is kind of a, an advanced veterinary um, specialty. So I'm a small animal internal medicine specialist. And really what that means is that I have extra training in complex medical diagnosis and disease management. So um, all of the, the things you see there are kind of the purview of the small animal internal medicine specialist. So complicated respiratory disease, gastrointestinal disease, including the pancreas, things going wrong with the liver, kidneys, urinary bladder, um, lots of immune mediated diseases. So diseases where the body is targeting itself. And then again, things like diabetes, um, thyroid diseases, problems with endocrine systems in the body. And a lot of this is just extra training in kind of deeper knowledge and um, how to think through really complex problems. But some of it is also that internists use um, diagnostics and treatment modalities that just might not be available to the average general practitioner. So the picture here, a little bit old at this point, um, but this is somebody at Cornell doing endoscopy in an animal. So putting a, a scope up in just like a person going for a colonoscopy. That's not something a general veterinarian would typically be able to do or have the equipment to do. Um, so that's something that we often will do in, in internal medicine. Um, you'd said again in the introduction that my passion is teaching. I am a teacher, um, and some of it is what we think of as traditional teaching. So I spend time in the classroom lecturing on things like infectious disease. Um, the picture here is, this is uh, James Law, who is essentially the founding faculty member of the Cornell Veterinary School, uh, lecturing to a class here. And so I do some of that for sure. Um, I also participate in laboratories. So teaching students hand-on clinical skills, like how to get a urine sample out of the bladder of a cat, for example. Um, another one that I just got involved with, which I really enjoy, is working in what's called the simulation laboratory. So it's an opportunity for our students to work with 
patients that are simulated. So we actually have a robotic dog that, that they can interact with and do things like CPR. So you can practice on something that's not live. Um, and then we also have these amazing actors that come in to pretend that they are the client involved in, in a clinical interaction. And so I've participated in a lot of communica communication exercises where students interact with the actor, um, especially around euthanasia scenarios, which are a really tough one um, to get good experience with before you actually become a veterinarian. Um, and the actors do an amazing job of making it feel real and giving the students fantastic feedback on that. And then I wrote it in capital letters because this is, this is what I really love. The clinical teaching is really where my heart is. Um, and I say, I get to be the Wizard of Oz. It'll make more sense in just a second. This is where I work. So this is the small animal community practice at Cornell. Um, most of the Cornell veterinary hospitals are specialty oriented. So doing my internal medicine things. This one is very different. This is a separate building and it does primary care. So the things most people that have pets have encountered when you bring them into the veterinarian. Um, all those things I listed on my first I am a veterinarian slide happens in this building. And the, the kind of quirk with this building is that the veterinary students are with us for four years. They spend three years in a classroom. And then in their fourth year, they rotate through each service of the hospital. So they'll spend two weeks on orthopedic surgery, two weeks on ophthalmology. Um, and then they come to the community practice for two weeks. Everywhere else in the hospital, at some point, somebody else will take over. So a student might do a history, they might do a physical exam, but then somebody else that's already a DVM, somebody that's already a veterinarian will step in and take over. In the community practice, that doesn't happen. They are the doctor from the moment the patient walks in the door, even before they walk in the door, all the way through to the time they leave and then all the follow up after that. So the students get that experience of being the doctor all the way through, which is really important because every May we kick them out of the, the vet to college and say, you know, good luck being doctors. So this is where they really get that full experience. And what I meant by I am the, the Wizard of Oz. My goal is to actually not be in the examination rooms with the clients, because I find that when I go into the exam room, the students that were doing such a great job of being doctors suddenly go back to being students. So my goal is to let them do their thing. And then if you look at this picture here, I don't know if you can see it very well. This is our treatment area, which is where I would hang out. So this is not where the clients are. These are two big TV screens here. And those TV screens, are hooked up to cameras and microphones in our examination rooms where the clients and the patients are. And so I can watch and listen as the students do their thing without actually being present in the room. Um, and then after the student has done their history taking, they've done their physical examination of the pet, they'll bring it back to me. I'll repeat everything with the student um, just to make sure we haven't missed anything. The student will run their plan by me as long as we, we agree on that or we come to a meeting of the minds. Then we'll do whatever needs to be done, give vaccines, draw blood, whatever it is. And then the student takes the patient back in to reunite with their owner. And throughout that whole process, the owner doesn't see me. So that's the goal and that's the way things typically work there. Uh, I just, I really, as I said, I love helping students work through these clinical situations and see them become the doctor. Um, part of the community practice, this is kind of a niche interest of mine. Um, we have this lovely ultrasound machine here. Um, ignore the kind of disaster behind it. Um, this, is, this is kind of my baby in the clinic. Um, it takes a lot of extra training to be an, a good ultrasonographer, and I was lucky enough to get really good training in that. So when we have patients that need ultrasounds, I get to do those. And the, the picture on the right is just what an ultrasound looks like. This is actually a a cat kidney. So this kind of oval structure here is the kidney of a cat with a little bit of fluid. That's the black there um, that doesn't belong around a kidney. So that's the kind of thing I do with the ultrasound. All right. So that's the, the teaching part. And then the last part I wanted to go over, I'm also an epidemiologist. Um, I got my PhD in epidemiology at Boston University. Um, and I did it at a school of public health for humans rather than in a veterinary program, because most veterinary epidemiologists focus on herd health. So they're talking about 
cows and chickens and pigs. That's, that's where all the epidemiology seems to happen. Um, I really wanted to take what they do with humans where there's kind of this interface between population and individual medicine and bring that to cats and dogs. So I, I, I did it at a human school of public health. Um, as an epidemiologist, I, I do a lot of study design. If you wanna answer a question, what do you need to do to make sure you get the, the right information? I do a lot of data management and then study analysis. So once, once we have the data, what do you do to try and figure out you know, what is the answer to that question you're asking? So when I tell people I'm an epidemiologist, this picture here on the right is kind of what people think of. Um, that's not what I do. This is what I do. There's a lot of spreadsheets and a lot of, um, this is a statistical coding program. Um, so it, it sounds more exciting than it is in some senses, but I really love it because epidemiology is also a way of thinking about the world. Um, so there's there's kind of the less exciting data part of it, but there's also the how do you think about the world? How do we make sure that we're thinking about things in a way that's not likely to lead to medical mistakes? And to kind of illustrate that, we're going completely outside of veterinary medicine. This has nothing to do with dogs and cats, right? Um, this is called the eyewitness problem. And when somebody first kind of put this out there, it actually caused a big kerfuffle in the legal system because it says that eyewitness testimony is actually really bad. When somebody says they saw something and they know they saw something, that might not actually be true. So there's a lot of words here. I'll try to, to go through it quickly, but essentially it's a fake scenario. So there's a, some city where 15% of the cab, taxi cabs in the city are blue and 85% of the cabs are green. And unfortunately one night, a taxi cab hits a pedestrian. And fortunately, there was a witness to the event and they told the police that the taxi cab was blue. So the police did an investigation. They found a blue taxi cab driver that kind of fit the right profile and they made an arrest. And before they went to trial, they decided to figure out, you know, just how good is this eyewitness? So they tried to replicate the circumstances of the accident, the same lighting, the same distance, and they showed this person, this eyewitness, a series of blue and green taxis and just said, you know, what color is it? And it turns out they were right 80% of the time, which is pretty good. It's not 100%, but it's pretty good. Um, so based on that information, this kind of puzzle says, you know, what's the probability? How likely is it that the taxi that hit the pedestrian was blue? And most people would say, well, there was an eyewitness. The eyewitness is right 80% of the time there's at least an 80% chance that the taxi was blue, right? Unfortunately, that's not true. The real answer is 41%. So with an eyewitness who's right 80% of the time, in this particular situation, there's only a 41% chance that the cab was actually blue, which is kind of mind blowing, right? A pretty good witness is still less than 50-50 on getting the right color. So that was a weird diversion. You know, what does that have to do with medicine? Well, that's actually a test, that's a diagnostic test. And we deal with diagnostic tests every day in, in medicine. So here's a very, very practical example of that in medicine. You have a five-year-old neutered male Dalmatian dog coming to your clinic in Maricopa County, Arizona for their annual exam. And the client says, I don't have any concerns, they seem fine, I'm just here for vaccines. Um, so we draw a little bit of blood for their annual, it's called a SNAP test, a test for four, four infectious diseases. And one of those diseases is Lyme disease. So we test this dog for Lyme disease. And this on the right is a picture of a positive Lyme test, a Lyme SNAP test, that blue dot on the upper left corner, that says the dog is positive for Lyme disease. So the dog turns positive on the test and we know that the test is going to correctly identify positive dogs 94% of the time and negative dogs 96% of the time. I should say dogs with Lyme disease 94% of the time and dogs without Lyme disease 96% of the time. So how likely is it that the dog has Lyme infection? And again, you'd say it's positive. It identifies positives correctly 96% of the time, but that's not actually the true answer. It's 7%. And that's because Lyme disease is really, really, really rare in Maricopa County, Arizona. So almost every veterinarian you'll encounter would run this test, see a blue dot and say, okay, this dog has Lyme disease. 
And epidemiology is this way of thinking about it that says, wait a minute, let's put the brakes on. This doesn't make sense in a dog with no clinical signs of disease in Maricopa County, Arizona. It's actually really unlikely, even though this is a great test, that it actually has Lyme disease. So it's just this really nice way of viewing the world. So this is why I'm an epidemiologist. Um, there's a whole nother host of things that, that go on with this, but essentially your brain does things, it plays tricks on you and you're unaware of it happening. And it happens all the time on a daily basis. And the scary thing is it has nothing to do with being smart. Smart people make these exact same mistakes as often as people that aren't as smart. So it's not, it's not how intelligent you are. It's just that your brain takes shortcuts. Most veterinarians really don't know how these actually impact their daily lives, and that can lead to medical mistakes. So part of my goal in being an epidemiologist is to teach students about these things and hopefully kind of fix that situation. So that is a very long-winded version of what I do. There's a lot more to it, but uh, we should probably move on. Well, thank you so much for sharing all about what you do. That was super interesting. and. I think it's amazing how you're able to help so many people and like students, as well as animals. Um, so next, could you tell us about your education, training, and career evolution? Sure. So this is my terrible drawing of the United States and apologies to people in states that I flubbed. Uh, so I was born in Barrington, New Hampshire, and I grew up there my entire life. Uh, both of my parents were professors of education. So I grew up kind of around teaching. And I think in the back of my mind, that was always something that I wanted to do. So I, I have a, a strong reason for that. I should also say I'm the, the one in the middle. My sister's on the left and my brother's on the right. So um, for college undergraduate, I went to Washington University in St. Louis and I majored in environmental science and biology. And I should say that I'm not one of those people that always wanted to be a vet. It was always kind of an option, but it wasn't until the Labrador Retriever that I kind of grew up with was euthanized right around my freshman year of college. Um, and I saw what an amazing job and, and how empathetic the the veterinarian was and doing that at such a difficult moment for us. Uh, but I really kind of solidified that desire. So I came to the decision a lot later than most people. But the biology major was, was what you need in terms of prerequisites for vet school. So after undergraduate, because I came to that decision kind of late in the game, I didn't have as much experience in veterinary clinics and that sort of thing as many applicants would. And so rather than applying for vet school right away, I spent a year in New Jersey. Um, things maybe I shouldn't say. I chose New Jersey because it's one of the states that has laxer laws about what you can do if you're not a licensed veterinary technician. So I got to do a lot of things like drawing blood, running tests that I might not be able to have done in New York State, for example. So I got some really good experience working in a veterinary clinic in New Jersey and then applied to vet school and ultimately ended up in Ithaca, New York um, at Cornell. So I graduated from Cornell in 2006. This is my, my wife, as you mentioned, we met first year, very first class in vet school, um, graduated together. And then after vet school, um, we went our separate ways for a year um, to do internships. She's a, a large animal vet, and so she went to a large animal vet practice in Phoenix. And I went to the University of Pennsylvania to do a small, small animal rotating internship in medicine and surgery. Um, so this is kind of your first year out of vet school. You can either just go into general practice or you can do additional training. And the internship is one year of, of kind of closely mentored training. Um, and I did this at, at, again, the University of Pennsylvania. It's a really busy hospital with a fantastic emergency caseload. And I left there feeling pretty confident about a lot of things. So after that, my, my um, wife had gotten a residency at Oregon State University. So we moved to Oregon. The first year there, I worked as a general practitioner and then applied to be a small animal internal medicine resident at Oregon State and got that residency that year. 
So I have one year of general practice and then I go back into kind of academia at Oregon State and did three years of training in small animal internal medicine. And then after that, we come back east. You can see the northeast is getting cluttered there. Um, we lived in and then eventually just outside Boston for about five years. I worked as an internal medicine specialist um, south of Boston while I was getting my PhD at Boston University. So that took about five years. And then when that was done, back to Ithaca and the Cornell University College of Veterinary Medicine. And I've been here um, for about six years now. That's amazing. That was um, a very interesting and like um, cool like career journey that you had. Um, I was wondering if you could share about your career evolution. Sure. So um, I already mentioned that I originally, it wasn't the thing I thought I was going to end up doing. And so it wasn't until college that I really made that decision. Um, and I should also say, we have veterinary students come through every year where this is a second or even a third career. So it's never too late. You can always, you can always make the change if you want to. Um, I did enter vet school thinking I was going to be an orthopedic surgeon. So surgery, bones, I thought that was really fascinating. And the fact that, like this cat here, I can't tie my own shoes without getting tangled up probably should have keyed me into that surgery wasn't my career choice. Um, so I learned in vet school, there were probably other, other paths for me to pursue. Um, so I went down the internal medicine pathway and I chose internal medicine really because I wanted to specialize in part because that's important for teaching. They really tend to want you to, to have some additional training. Um, but I didn't want to be so specialized that I was just doing one thing for the rest of my life. I like the variety and the diversity of veterinary medicine and internal medicine is one of those areas where you're, you're still seeing and doing a lot of different things on a daily basis. So it was a good, I can, I can specialize, but still be a bit of a polymath. Um, other parts of my career evolution, I, I say serendipity happens. I really was planning to teach in internal medicine and I teach in primary care now. And it's because I went to a conference and the, the person who's now the Dean of the vet college um, had been a mentor of mine when I was a student. And I ran into him at the conference and he said, you know, I have this job that I want you to apply for. And it's in primary care. And this was when I was just starting my PhD. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm five years away from being able to say yes to the job. And he's like, just, just think about it. And so I ended up taking that job and it's been a phenomenal decision. Um, my passion for teaching and that clinical teaching, the primary care sections where you get to do that the most and the best, I think. Um, other people might disagree with me, but I, I really think that's, that's where you get to be most involved in their education. Um, the other part of it is that internal medicine, yeah, we play with some really fancy tools. We deal with some really complicated cases, but fundamentally a lot of the training is just about a good rigorous thought process through any clinical case. And that's something that any student can learn. So um, I thought it was a good transition. And then the last one, make space for life. Um, I think like so many people in veterinary medicine, you know, I was always always doing more, always jumping through hoops. Um, and then that picture of us in Boston is right around the time I was working 44 hours a week as an internist. I was a PhD student. We just had our first child. I was trying to renovate a house. And at some point I said, this is, this is kind of silly, right? Um, so making space for family, making space to do things that aren't necessarily veterinary medicine is incredibly important. And in this, this profession, much as I love it, we struggle with mental health and suicide and things like that. And I think we're really doing a, a much better job than we used to of trying to impart that to our students and trying to embody it ourselves. So, um, you know, I, when I leave work, I leave work behind me. Um, and that's something that 20 years ago, veterinarians didn't do, they were always on. So that's kind of the, 
the very short version of career evolutions. Thank you for sharing that. Those were some very insightful points. How do you believe that the, or wait, sorry, what was the most rewarding aspect of your career? There are so many of those. Um, I think just broadly speaking, this is the picture on the left is light bulb moments. And that's what I love about teaching. Um, almost every single student we work with at some point has that light bulb moment and most of them have them multiple times. And one of them is just that they can do this. So getting to be the veterinarian for the first time is intimidating. And after a while they realize, yeah, they can do this. They're prepared for this. So those light bulb moments are just absolutely amazing. And it's great because we get new students every two weeks and I get to see that light bulb moment every two weeks, which is phenomenal. So on the right, um, just some recent students that had each done half of a dog neuter. Um, and it was their first time doing a dog neuter. And you can tell even with the masks on, they're just absolutely beaming. Both of them are so proud and like they did it. They did it by themselves. I wasn't, you know, I, I didn't have sterile gloves on. This is all of them with me just there to, to kind of talk them through it. So that's the most rewarding aspect for me. And then, you know, you get to play with puppies and kittens. That's always a plus as well. Yes, that is definitely a plus. Um, so next, could you share about how you believe that the profession has changed during the span of your career and how you and other successful professionals have adapted to this? Yeah. Um, I think there's, there's a really obvious how the profession has changed, and this has even been over my lifetime. So these are class pictures from Cornell. On the left is 1965, and I chose that because just to the left, the person you run into to the left of the 19 is R.C. Campbell, who was my uncle. So my uncle was a class of 65 veterinary graduate. And if you look at that, it is a sheet of almost exclusively white men. There's probably one person of color, and there's one woman in the second row from the bottom on the left. And that's it. And that was veterinary medicine for 150 plus years. And in the 1980s, it underwent a really dramatic change that's still underway. So my class, I graduated in 2006, is the picture on the right. Um, that's a class of, I think it was 86 and 13 of us are male. And that's, that's pretty consistent. So um, when I went into my internship, I was the only male intern out of a class of 13 interns. So it's gone from an exclusively male profession to a very heavily female. We're now about two thirds female in the United States, um, which I think has been a fantastic change. Um, I think that there hasn't, I don't know that I've had an adjustment myself to that. Um, I think some of the older practitioners have really struggled with that, but I, I went into vet school at a time when, yeah, that was just a fact of life. Um, I think one of the things we are struggling with that really hasn't changed, if you look at my class year picture, it's still majority white. The profession is, is 86 plus percent white. Um, and we're really struggling with diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts to try and expand that in the profession. Um, I recently did a survey of our vet students about students that have encountered barriers to accessing veterinary care themselves. So these are actual veterinary students. Um, and a decent percentage of them um, actually said that one of the barriers that they've encountered is that the veterinary teams that they encountered don't look and sound like they do. So it's something we're really struggling with in the profession and we don't, we don't have good answers for it yet. Um, other things that have changed, that picture on the left, um, I didn't want to, to call them out in type, but Mars Incorporated, so maker of M&M bars and Mars bars, that's why he's eating chocolate bars, um, is now the largest veterinary practice owner in the world. Um, in 2017, one out of every 10 US veterinarians was an employee of Mars, and that number has gone up since then. Um, so one of the things we're really faced with is a transition from a, a, a profession where Almost every veterinary practice was independently owned to one where probably the majority at this point are 
or close to it at least, are corporately owned. And that, that's been a, a difficult transition as a whole and has some implications for um, pay and equity and all sorts of other things. And um, that's not really impacted me. My one year in general practice, I, I worked for a corporation, but it wasn't a, it was one that had just been sold and the owner had stayed on as the medical chief and they just let her run it as, as she had. So I've not really had to struggle with that myself, but I definitely see it in the students we send out um, when they're talking about what jobs to take and the pros and cons of, of corporate versus privately. And then um, on the right-hand side, just some of the, the higher tech things that are coming down the pike. Um, one of our surgeons, um, Dr. Buat here, is uh, one of the first veterinarians to get their hands on a da Vinci surgical robot. So these very expensive robots that can do very precise surgeries. Um, so we're just starting to kind of get to play around with that. And then at the bottom is a dog DNA test. So we can start doing kind of individualized medicine. Um, these are things that are big on the human side. We're excited about them on the veterinary side. But the kind of concern is that veterinary care is expensive. And these are things that make it more expensive. And we may want to make sure that it's accessible to everyone. And so there's this tension in the profession between we want to offer the newest and best things, but we don't want to price people out of being able to, to afford care for their pets. So the big buzzword right now is something called um, spectrum of care, meaning offering a variety of different options that meet a variety of different needs. And um, it's something that I've, I've become very passionate about and I think is, is probably one of the next big areas to be explored in veterinary medicine, making sure that we can still advance technology, but give everybody the care that they need and deserve. Those are some super interesting points. Honestly, I learned so much from just this past slide alone that I never knew before. Um, so next, could you tell us about what students should consider when choosing which pre-vet or vet school to apply to? Sure. Um, I think just as with choosing undergraduate, it's great if you can visit and just make sure that it feels right. Um, there are times when you'll set foot on a campus and just be like, this doesn't feel good. And you should trust your intuition. Um, and then there are times where you step onto a campus and you're like, this feels like home and pay attention to that as well. So that's I think we discount that, but I think it's important. You're gonna be spending four really intense years wherever this is, make sure it's a place that you feel you can be happy. Um, the next is financial and veterinary tuition is, is just going through the roof and will probably continue to do so. Um, so you go where you financially can best afford to go. And for me, at the time I was applying, um, New Hampshire, my home state, actually paid the difference between in-state and out-of-state tuition for two students from New Hampshire at Cornell because New Hampshire doesn't have a vet college. Um, so I was lucky enough to be one of those two students. If, if I had to go somewhere else, I could have easily paid twice as much for the same sort of education. So the finances are really, really important and I would really encourage people to think about that. And then the last thing is thinking about what programs are offered. So. I love Cornell, I think I got a great education here, but if I wanted to do poultry, if I wanted to do pigs, if I wanted to do dairy cattle, Cornell's not the place to go for those things. If you wanna do pigs, you'll go to Iowa, North Carolina, somewhere like that. Um, so thinking about whether the program matches your interests is really important as well. Um, you can, we've had a few students come through that ended up doing poultry or things like that, but it's, it's, it's a really tough experience when you don't have what you need in the basic curriculum and have to find it by yourself. Yeah, those are great pieces of advice. Thank you for sharing that. Um, what do you think are some common mistakes that pre-vet or vet students make? I think the two that, and they're, they're fairly closely related. Um, one is not having enough kind of in-depth veterinary experience in more than just what you're interested in. So, um, and I'm, I'm a bit of a hypocrite here because my experience is all in small animal medicine, but I think it's really important that people that are 
planning to be small animal practitioners still spend time working on a dairy farm or riding around with a, an ambulatory large animal veterinarian um, just to have exposure to that, to learn the animal handling and care aspects of it, um, and to see if maybe there's something out there that they didn't know was going to interest them. Um, we have a lot of students that come in thinking they're going to do maybe equine or large animal, a lot of students that come in thinking they're going to do exotics and wildlife, but end up transitioning to doing small animal practice. And that might be practical considerations, there are just more jobs there, but sometimes it's that they're exposed to something that they didn't know was there and that changes their trajectory. And I think getting that exposure earlier can be really helpful in making sure you have a good sense of what's available and where you want to go with it. So that's the first one, getting more experiences with those sorts of things. And then the second is on your, your resume or your CV, you do want to have a, a good kind of breadth of experiences. You're the student class president, you're on the volleyball team, whatever it is. But we wanna see that that experience is kind of high quality. So the student that thinks that they're gonna be a really good applicant because they're in 40 different clubs, we know you're not probably deeply involved with 40 clubs, whereas somebody that's in one or two clubs and you can see that there's a real depth of commitment there. Um, they get really good letters of recommendation from the club advisors or something like that because they, they were that dedicated. That carries a lot more weight. So really making sure that your, your extracurriculars are kind of well-defined and things that you really are passionate about and engaged in deeply is really important as well. Yeah, that is definitely super important. And those are very uh, great tips. So last question, could you give me an idea about the key value sets, personal attributes, and soft skills that make veterinarians successful? Yeah, um, there's a lot going on with this one. Um, I think the, the soft skills part of it is, a, is one that a lot of people interested in being veterinarians run up against. So there's a lot of us are introverts. I am, I am one of them. And there's this thought that, you know, maybe I'm interested in medical things, but I don't want to have to deal with people. So I'm going to go the veterinary route. And after having experience with both sides of that equation, I would say most veterinarians probably engage with people more than many physicians do. Um, so the human communication side of things is really important. Being able to to effectively communicate with owners, to empathize with owners, that's a huge part of the job. When I was working in, in Boston in internal medicine, I would routinely spend three or four hours a night on the telephone, um, just talking people through difficult decisions. Um, and those communication skills are, are really critical. So if, if you're somebody that doesn't want to be around people, it might not be a great career for you, honestly. Um, other soft skills, I think that um, one of the biggest is listening. So that's part of the whole communication paradigm, but we find that the clinicians and the students that are most effective are the ones that really give pet owners, animal owners, the space to tell them what the problem is and to tell them what they need. So listening skills are really, really important. And it's challenging when you're a clinician seeing appointments every 15 minutes to give them that time to communicate, but it's really important. Um, I think another big one I would throw out there is teamwork. So one of the challenges we sometimes encounter with our students is that there is some element of competition to getting into vet school, right? We always, we used to love to tell ourselves that it's harder to get into vet school than it is to get into med school. I don't know if they still say that, uh, but it's true. There are a limited number of spots in veterinary school with a large pool of applicants. And so there's this competition element of it. And some students try to carry that through into the veterinary curriculum where they feel like they're competing with their peers as they progress to the curriculum. And they really don't need to. And in fact, it ends up being a detriment to them when they behave that way. Um, a lot of our curriculum is taught in small groups. So you'll meet with a small group of about seven to eight students and work your way through problems. And it's really a team building exercise. And even if you know the answer right off the bat, one of the most important things you're learning is how to work with the team. And 
students generally tend to realize fairly quickly that the more effort they put into helping the group, the better everyone in the group does. Um, so I think that teamwork aspect of it, veterinary medicine almost across the board is a team sport. You're working with technicians, receptionists, clients, the entire veterinary staff, um, and the ones that are, are kind of competitive and try to go it alone, it ends up being a really lonely and difficult road for them. Yeah, I agree. That, those are some very helpful points that you made. Well, Dr. Carney, thank you so much for chatting with me today and sharing your experiences and insights as a veterinarian and an educator. It's so inspiring to hear about your career journey helping animals and hundreds of future veterinarians, and I wish you continued success in your career. Thank you.